Next, from the state capitol, Republican lawmakers Senator Dale Ryder and Representative Patty Bellick respond to Governor Quinn's ideas on how to fix the growing deficit in the state's Medicaid program. This runs about 15 minutes. Hi, I'm State Rep Patty Bellock, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to address the issue. Uh, we, da Senator Ryder and I have been working on the Medicaid issue for about the last four or five years, so we're pretty passionate about it. And we were honored to serve on the working group uh, with the governor and with uh, Julie Hamos. So we have been working passionately, I would say, for the, about the last 10 to 12 weeks. And we would still like to look forward to working some more on the group, because the governor asked us uh, directly to come up with $2.7 billion in cuts. And we agree with him that this program needs to be sustained. We need to protect the integrity of the program, and the program is out of control. The program is designed to meet the needs of the most fragile population in Illinois, like the governor said. And we are taking this opportunity right now to look at that system, such as other states are, New York, Tennessee, all around the country, they're all doing the same thing. And we are too. And we think that the programs that we addressed in the reform are good. We don't agree with all of them as it's hard to get agreement upon everybody, but that's why we look forward to working further in this, in achieving the $2.7 uh, billion dollars in cuts, and at the same time, reforming. We set aside last year the Medicaid reform bill. We had eight major reforms in there that we wanted to see implemented last year. Actually, four of those had been in law a year before that. We have not seen that yet. Those again are in this reform, but we feel that if we can get all of those reforms done and continue on a few major ones that we'll like to address right now, that we can get to the $2.7 billion without increasing a tax on somebody. We feel that in the last year, we have already had six to seven billion dollar increase in tax on the people of Illinois. We look forward to working on this program because this is a $15 billion program, $11.5 billion of which the taxpayers of Illinois are paying for right now. They're asking us for accountability in that program. They want to see the people served that need to be served, but they also want the system to be reformed. They know that there's not a good eligibility accountability here. They need to have reforms in how the system is accessed by people. They know there's waste and fraud in the system, and we need to address that now, and we have the opportunity. If we have a couple more weeks to work on this, we think we can get to the $2.7 billion and actually have a better system, a reform system, a redesign system, and a system that is actually going to be more accountable to the taxpayers of Illinois. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Senator Dale Ryder, Representative Bellick. Thank you for joining me here, and we uh, welcome the opportunity to talk a little bit about what the governor had to say today about his plan. Um, let's rewind a little bit to the start of the session where the governor stood up before a joint session of the General Assembly and said, we have to reduce the Medicaid program in Illinois by $2.7 billion. The governor was right when he made that statement. If we don't reduce the program by $2.7 billion, we will do what the governor and his predecessor and their legislative allies have done year after year after year in this building, which is kick bills off into the future, push bills off into the future. That's part of our problem, a big part of our problem in our Medicaid system. Now the governor has surrendered to his own announced goal. His plan that you see here today does not reduce the Medicaid program by $2.7 billion. In fact, half of his program relies on a tax increase that will simply be used to fuel more spending and a near $700 million cut to Medicaid providers like hospitals and nursing homes who already suffer from some of the lowest rates and the longest payment delays in the entire nation. And what's so ironic and sad about that is that if you cut rates by near the measure of what the governor's talking about, fewer providers, fewer hospitals, fewer nursing homes, fewer doctors, fewer pharmacists will take part in the Medicaid program. The fewer providers there are, the less access there is for health care for the very populations that the governor says he's the most concerned about. Now, I appreciated the governor's words that he thought that the working group had done its best and that he was going forward. The working group's not done. This is not the working group's plan, this is the governor's plan. Uh, and we don't view the goal, as the governor said, of $2.7 billion in reductions as a goal. It's a mandate. This is what you have to do to save the program for the people in the state who need it the most. 
And so we were, we're ready to go back to work beginning Tuesday to continue to find ways not to add new taxes, not to cut underpaid providers even more like what the governor is suggesting, but to reduce the size of the program that is already too big uh, for our taxpayers and our constituents to pay for. So with that, we have to answer any questions. Can you pass a one dollar per pack tax hike? Go ahead. You want to? I don't know. I mean, that's how rushed we were with this program. I mean, we joined in in a bipartisan fashion, and we worked really well together. And it was just a week and a half ago that we were told, you know, kind of wrap it up. And so we hadn't even had time to get back to our caucus. I don't think it's something that my caucus is going to like. But you know what? We're willing to put whatever we did there on the table. I just don't agree with the new tax issue. As Dale said, we wanted to get to the $2.7 billion in cuts. And I'll tell you, there were several other ideas that we have not implemented yet, one of them being the passive redetermination that was in the enhanced um, income ve verification that we had before. What that says is the Auditor General two years ago did a scathing report on the All Kids saying that in 16 years some of those children had never been audited to see if they were still eligible for the program. We have thousands of people on, that ro on our rolls that we can do that. We asked to stop that passive redetermination. Why shouldn't every year people that are on the program come back in and just have a test of whether they're still eligible. We also want to scrub the rolls. We heard recently that the Medicaid cards were set out and thousands were returned and said moved out of state. Take those people off the rolls. Those are major uh, parts of the population that we can address and Senator Ryder and I and a lot of our caucuses think we can do that and get to the 2.7 billion dollars without moving ahead of the tax on the people. Ray, I want to follow up. Ray, I, I, don't, I think the answer to that question is no. I mean, this governor championed and signed after his allies in the General Assembly passed a $7 billion tax increase a little over a year ago and they told us then that that would solve the problem. That we'll pay our old bills with this, we'll close the deficit. Look where we're at today. We're spending more money. The problems in the Medicaid program are worse. I think that hopefully even some of the governor's own party have gotten it that just raising taxes time and time again isn't working because these folks won't spend the money appropriately. The governor said we need to reduce the size of the program by $2.7 billion in his budget address. That's what we want to do. Doesn't, doesn't Quinn make a compelling argument though when he points to the, the fact that cigarette taxes have increased twice under Thompson, uh, twice under Edgar, once under uh, Governor Ryan? I mean, I, and I, I guess I'd also be curious, in, in any of those votes. I mean, you guys were both around, at least for some of them. Did, did either of you vote for those cigarette tax increases? Well, the, the, the governor lays out, I, I, I'm assuming, an accurate portrayal of what the history is, but because something was a good idea yesterday or last year or last decade, doesn't it necessarily make it a good idea now? I would, I'm, I venture to guess, in fact, I'm pretty certain that none of those cigarette taxes were passed a little over a year after a 67% increase in folks' income taxes. So, I mean, this is not something that stands alone. This is unfortunately a habit of the governor, his predecessor, and their legislative allies is to start the session talking tough. Talk about cuts and talk about reform. And while we're still six weeks out from the end of session, the governor's waving the white flag and saying, you know, we're really not going to change the system that much and we're going to go ahead and raise taxes. Do you know if either of you voted for, the, for any of those cigarette tax increases in the past? I don't think I was here when they took I don't know. I, I'd have to look. I mean, I'm not even sure the most recent one right. um, was when I was in the General Assembly. I don't know. We have to look at that. But I mean, irrespective of, I don't even know what those cigarette taxes, if they passed, were used to fund. I, today, we stand in front of uh, all the people of the state with a Medicaid program that is growing faster than the rest of the budget and the, the taxpayers can handle, with a Medicaid program that can't pay its bills to lift more money out of people's pockets isn't the answer. And you know, the governor agreed with us when he gave a budget address that a tax increase wasn't the answer, that reducing the size of the program was the answer, and we still think that that's what needs to be done. A question for either of you. How can you be confident that cutting $2.7 billion from the Medicaid program that the state can manage it so well that some sick person out there, poor person, might be put in serious physical jeopardy with these cuts. Because that seems to be the bottom line. They're saying, you cut this and we're going to be in life-threatening situations. How do you, are you confident that this can be done so well that someone might not be hurt or even killed by it? 
Well, we're asking the administration to do this, and one of the major things that we did in the Medicaid reform that is continuing now that Secretary Hamos has done is the care coordination. And the whole point of the care coordination program is to not let that happen, what you were talking about. It's what the governor said. It's about wellness. It's about preventive disease. And it's about trying to protect that most vulnerable population so you take care of the people that you were talking about and you don't have other people in the system that drive away in a Cadillac and a Lexus and have people in the programs that shouldn't be in the program. That takes a lot of work and we're asking the Secretary of HFS and the Governor to implement the reforms that we've asked for and to be very careful about it. In fact, we asked in the working committee the other day to specifically have the staff look at how we're going to implement the programs and how we're going to utilize what you'll see in the 56 programs there. How are we going to do that the best way we can so that we can pre prevent people from falling through the cracks? You are dealing with a serious population. This was not an easy job. You're talking about children on ventilators. You're talking about seniors in wheelchairs. You're talking about the most fragile population in Illinois. And every single person that's in that working group are people that care about that. That's why nobody missed a meeting. Everybody was there 7 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock at night, because they care about it. And we want to do it right. But we also want to do it in a comprehensive, caring way. I think it's important. I want to. It's imp I think it's important to to note that in the last ten years, the number of people on Medicaid in Illinois has almost doubled. And despite what the governor would contend that that's driven by the recession, more than half of that enrollment growth was added before the recession ever started. Okay. Now, do you get the sense that the Medicaid population is healthier today than it was ten years ago? I sure don't. I mean, you can't issue any guarantees. What we do know from our experience over the last ten years is just recklessly expanding the program and not managing the program and simply throwing more and more and more money after it doesn't make people healthier. That's the proposition under which the governor is operating, and it's been demonstrated to fail. Uh, do you have out there that, uh, that you wanted that aren't in the governor's proposal? Well, sure. Here's yeah. here. one, uh, a couple we could talk about here is, one is an asset test. We believe, Republicans believe, that if you're going to qualify for a program of public assistance, there ought to be a limit to the assets that you have. It should be measured by more than just income, but uh, assets as well. Uh, another example is, and the, the Medicaid Reform Act that passed 14 months ago now banned by state law a practice called presumptive eligibility, which means basically in Illinois, once you're in the Medicaid program, you all but have to drive to the Springfield office and wave your arms and beg and plead to get off the program, and you stay on it forever. Okay, passive redetermination is still the administration's policy to this day. I, what I'm suggesting is there are a lot of ideas Republicans have put out there. The administration just isn't willing to implement them, even though they say they will, or they're not willing to adopt them. There's two good examples right there. There's another one. You, you, last time we talked, you were yeah. saying how the governor was actually Let's finish the cut here, Terry. Terry, let's finish the cut. In Chicago. Oh, right. And that he hadn't provided the or put in for the waivers from the federal government <laughs> to to reduce some of the expenditures. Has he done anything here at this? Well, that was done very quickly as we speak. It was after that last press conference that four days later they put in the uh, request for the citizenship uh, verification that we had been asking for for a year and a half. So. Again, we are for the program. I just wanted to mention one of the other things that we talked about was uh, that you would put a cap on optional services. Now, optional services are huge, and just to tell you, in comparison with the rest of the states in the United States, we have practically every optional service there is offered in the Medicaid program. We have more than any other state in the United States. So when we took a look at this in the working group, we talked about it, but we really we came up with a few programs in uh, you know utilization on those, but really we could look at taking a cap on all optional services, meaning if you have the adult dental, which we have in there. We don't want to take away all the adult dental. We don't want to take away the podiatry for people that are diabetics. But couldn't we put a cap on those optional services that would say, such as a voucher, that maybe you can have $500 or $1,000 or $4,000 of those services in a year? That's a good utilization, but we haven't done it. So that is a main objective that would be something else that we can work on in the next two weeks. Why won't they go for that? 
they may go for it. It just all of a sudden it just kind of ended two weeks ago. And I we were willing to work on several other things. The all kids program, maybe rolling that back another you know notch. We were looking at several other issues. What we've just brought up five or six of them today. But the more this gets pressed from all of you, the more groups walk in our office with other ideas. We asked 22 groups that we put down that were going to be eliminated. We brought them in and we said, you may be eliminated. Tell us how to verify why your services are important and tell us how you can have better utilization. And we took a lot of those suggestions from pharma, from the pharmacists, from the hospital association. Several of those are incorporated in the plan. So if we have a few more weeks to work on this, I had a group that came in yesterday about home health care that said they could save $300 million. So this is an opportunity to take a look at more ways that we can reform the system but still uh, you know, use this to provide the better, best quality access and care to that fragile population without a tax cut. I mean a tax increase, I'm sorry. No. Is this, is this putting a stall to those efforts? Is it causing any friction between Republicans and Democrats? Or is this going to help roll that ball forward as he said it's available? Well, we'll see what the reaction is, but when we left the room yesterday, Everybody there, the Democrats and the Republicans, were committed to moving forward. We had already made a, a date to meet, uh, I think, Tuesday morning or whatever time. And as I said, everybody's made every me meeting. And if the governor just wants to end here, we're full force in moving forward and achieving that $2.7 billion in cuts. Amanda, I think one way to clear that up for sure, Amanda, is I, I would like to see the governor and his people take the plan that he announced today, put it in bill form, and let's vote on it next week. Up or down? And then we'll find out whether or not the working group's work is done. And what will happen if that happens? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not taking a poll of the members of the General Assembly, but I suspect the working group will go back to work. He said if you don't <laughs> pass the dollar cap, you don't get for cigarette tax, uh, that you'll have to cut $675 million on all kinds of programs, education, yeah. public safety, et cetera, et cetera. Do you believe it? No. No, no what will happen? <laughs> <laughs> what, we'll, what, we'll, what we'll have to do, what we'll have to do, is go back to work and do what the right. governor originally said that he thought we needed to do, right. which is reduce the Medicaid program by 2.7 billion dollars, rather than fuel more spending with a tax increase. So That's what we have to do. Has he threatened tax increase too often then to be credible? No, in fact, the governor's very credible when he says he's going to raise people's taxes. He's getting it done all the time, and that's kind of why the, we, we don't think he should, We don't think it's a good idea, because when you raise taxes and fuel more spending, you're giving up on controlling spending, which is exactly what needs to happen in this building, and exactly what the governor and his predecessor and their Democrat allies in the General Assembly have refused to recognize since they've been in power. There are those who say that Kaplan is disconnected in Last part question. of the legislative process. Is this an example of that? And if that's the last question, I'll add on. Is any rate <laughs> yeah, not, well done, man. Is any sort of rate reduction acceptable? And do you agree with all of the cuts that are in his program? Or is there anything that's in his 58 that you wouldn't go on? What was your first question? <laughs> uh, is this an example of flawed leadership no. by the governor? That he's coming out with this. I mean, a lot of people say he's disconnected. That him throwing this out there is Heckwin being Heckwin and not having a glimpse of the reality of the General Assembly. I'm not, I'm not going to criticize the governor for standing up and saying what he's for. He's the governor. That's fine. I do think it's an example of flawed policy on the on the governor's part. And like I said, maybe if, if they put it in bill form and put it before the General Assembly, we'll see what the other 176 members of the General Assembly think about that. So I mean, the bottom line is we believe in what the governor articulated in his budget address because we believe the Medicaid program needs to be reduced in size to fit what the taxpayers can afford. Uh, and we disagree that the governor's given up on that goal and decided that very steep rate cuts to providers that are already horribly paid and wait forever to get their payments and a tax increase is the way to go. Thank you.